Well, a good howdy to all you listeners out there. Now, if you're just tuning in, I, we have got a special offer for you. That's right. The Hood Rat Strategist Radio Program. We got a very special 4th of July weekend sale going on. Oh, my goodness. And you know what? We got specials. We got specials out the wazoo. You know what we got specials on? You know what's so special? Oh, my goodness. We are just busting at the seams with stories this week about... <clears throat> American fascism. That's fascism uh, American style. Do you like your fascism institutional? Oh boy. Well, we've got some stories about the Customs and Border Patrol doing some downright atrocities down at the border in some concentration camps. You like your Do you like your fascism homegrown? How about some stories about proud boys going around threatening innocent journalists and people oh do you like your oh maybe you like your fascism to have a little of both in it well we got a story about some shenanigans out from oregon about uh, the oregon gop and some uh right wing militia groups teaming up oh my goodness and oh my goodness that's not all i got I, we got tons and tons of stories about american fascism down here again come on down to our fourth of july sale here at the hood rat strategist radio program oh man we got we got a report. We got a a, con- a progressive congresswoman, uh, black, a progressive black congresswoman, doing a speech to a bunch of racist jackholes. Oh, we got we got stories about <clears throat> we got stories about conservatives accusing anti-fascists of uh, throwing uh, cements around. Oh, we've got. Oh, and you know what else? Uh, you might be asking. Oh, well, all the all these stories about fascism. How much is it? When did they start? Now. If I were to tell you it started in 2016, would you be surprised? Well, you know what? It wasn't even 2016. Was it 2001? Are we talking 2001 when uh, War on Terror permitted the Patriot Act and the dissolution of a lot of our personal freedoms? Not even that. What if I told you that American homegrown fascism started all the way back in 1776? That's right, ladies and gentlemen. We've got a story coming up later on the program. Some history about how um, the very nation of the United States of America was founded on institutional white supremacy. So please come on down only this weekend, our special 4th of July sale. Oh, all the fascism must go. All the fascism must go. So I hope you uh, enjoyed. That was uh, that was my goofy little introduction today. Uh Honestly, I thought we all needed a little bit of levity because uh, as as I was explaining through that uh, kind of goofy uh, commercial spoof, um, this has been a, a pretty downer week. Uh, there has been a lot of fascism, and uh, frankly, it's not altogether uh, unironic that uh, it is occurring during the week of the 4th of July. <clears throat> so, we're going to get in on those stories, and, and uh, I, I just wanted to kind of soften the blow, because again, these are all very alarming stories that we're going to be talking about later on the program. <clears throat> We've also got some local stuff to talk about as well. Um, the Wall Street Journal actually did an article on the Kalamazoo Promise. We wanted to talk about that a little bit. Uh, and some changes to the Michigan marijuana rule that uh, actually, I am... Maybe I'm going to touch on it briefly. Next week, I'd like to come back with a more thorough analysis because there is a potential bombshell in there that I want to make sure it actually is what it looks like. Um, a good bombshell is actually some good news. Uh, but before that, I want to play a clip from Democracy Now! And they interview somebody very familiar, and uh, I'm just going to go ahead and play it. And uh, Granted, we did uh, kind of wrap out up our Pride coverage last week, but uh, here's an extra little bit. Again, this is... Democracy Now! doing an interview with just a, a particularly brilliant young woman. I just had to go ahead and play it. My name is Nora. I came in all the way from Chicago. I'm here uh, mainly for the 50th anniversary of Stonewall to pay my respects, but I'm also here to march against the corporatization of pride and the police presence that uh, is in contemporary pride fests these days. Your sign says affordable housing for all, hashtag pride. Talk about how this march is is engaging with all these issues, affordable housing, abolishing ICE. Well, I've seen multiple signs for all different kinds of issues. There's one for intersex justice right there. There's some for abolishing ICE. There's one for uh, keeping the police out of pride. 
side. All these issues do in fact harm queer people, including especially housing, because um, a disproportionate amount of LGBT youth are uh, dealing with housing insecurity due to lack of uh, family support that they would otherwise be able to stay at a, at a mother or aunt's place. And it's really frustrating to see it. so many of my friends have to go through with it. My name is Martha Shelley, and I was one of the people... So, uh, again, for those of you who may not be hip to what was just going on there, uh, that was former co-host Nora Getz um, being interviewed on Democracy Now!, which, uh, that's a pretty big deal. If you aren't as much of a big leftist nerd um, as uh, I am or some of the people on the program, it's kind of like being on, it's it's the uh, a, a leftist equivalent of show, getting on American Idol. That's that's kind of the, what it's like to get interviewed on Democracy Now. So congratulations to Nora. Uh, and you know, granted, uh, we we give big tip of the hat to her for being so eloquent uh, when given a chance to uh, kind of uh, take the spotlight. <clears throat> so. Um, Kind of thinking over what I want to talk about next. You know, I think I will uh, again kind of get some of the um, more uh, is it good or, or productive news out of the way before we really start diving into some of the more morbid stuff. Uh, I wanted to talk just a little bit about the emergency recreational marijuana rules. This was just dropped today. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the potential implications of it. I'm going to read through the article a little bit. <clears throat> and uh, again, this is this is definitely like this is just information that I want to make sure that the that the listeners have. So <clears throat> this was published today, uh, written by uh, Amy uh, uh, Blo- Blochini. And I'm sorry, Amy, hit up the show if I if I massacred your last name. Sorry. So, um, as it reads in the article, recreational marijuana smoking lounges, festivals, and home delivery will soon be allowed in Michigan under a set of emergency rules state officials released Wednesday. The rules define the launch of the recreational marijuana market in Michigan and were signed Tuesday by Governor Gretchen Whitmer. They outline outline how the new adult use market will function, how the business license application process will work, and how the recreational and medical marijuana industries will interact. Despite the rules being issued this week, sales of recreational marijuana are still months away. The release of the rules now is intended to give Michigan's local governments time to decide whether they want to ban adult use marijuana businesses before the state marijuana regulatory agency begins accepting business license applications. The emergency rules expire in six months. And here's here's what it means. And I want to make sure the the def, the meaning of uh, emergency rules basically in this case means um, it was. Some, basically something that needed to be put out to provide a rubric for these localities and there was a, a deadline for these rules to be put out and now they are. A um, couple weeks in the program, uh, I did some criticism about how Michigan has rolled out its legalization uh, versus how Illinois is uh, poising to do so. Um, this does address one or two of those things. And I, I will give it certain credit for that. Um, although, again, uh, it is kind of a, a slap shot and uh, co- Again, by virtue of the way we got legal marijuana in, in this state, things have been kind of cobbled together, um, except for the runway that was provided by both a lot of GOP and corporate-friendly Democrats. Um, again, not many people in the state house or Senate were thinking about equity and justice um, in terms of Michigan's blossoming and about-to-blossom marijuana economy, but... Let me go ahead and, and talk a little bit more. Here's a, here's a quote from there. Uh, this is uh, uh, Agency Director Andrew Brisbo. He says, It provides clarity on the state's approach on establishing the regulatory program and doing so in a way that is consistent as possible with the standards in the medical market that exists now. And doing so in a way that provides adequate time for municipalities to evaluate what we put in the rules and to make a determination on how the municipality wants to approach this new market before we start taking applications. 
Brisbo plans to start taking business and event applications November 1st and said some businesses could receive their licenses to operate that same month. That's five weeks before the agency legally has to start licensing businesses under the law Michigan voters approved in November 2018 that legalized weed. Regulations on the recreational marijuana market mostly mirror those on the medical marijuana market, except when it comes to money. Now, here's the most interesting part of the article to me. Um, Again, I want to do some digging and make sure this means what I think it says. But I'll I'll just read it and then kind of explain why I'm in such a tizzy about this. Officials are dropping the capitalization requirements for prospective recreational marijuana businesses. That's a stark difference from medical marijuana businesses who have to show that they have from $200,000 to $500,000 in assets depending on the license they seek. So... Something we've talked a lot on the, about on the program, and you've probably, if you're a longtime listener, and you've heard, uh, particularly on, on weeks where we're talking a lot about the marijuana issue, you've heard me throw this figure out a lot. Well, you know, it's unfair, and it's tooled toward, towards uh, large corporations, because if you're trying to start a recreational marijuana business, you're going to need between 200 and 500 grand, so on and so forth. My criticism that, you know, how is that going to help? The uh, person who, the average person who is involved in the underground marijuana economy, wants to start a legitimate business. Uh, most of them likely do not have two hundred grand just laying around. Now, again, I don't want to, uh, you know, you know, put on my party hat and blow some streamers just yet, because I still want to do some digging and figure out well, what does that actually mean as far as getting these licenses, and how much does that still going to cost the average person. But potentially, this could be some very good news. Um, and uh, if, it, if uh, they are getting that requirement out of the way, it could open up the doors for that very specific population that I have just mentioned. Um, overall, could be a very good thing, um, particularly for the state of Michigan and here in Kalamazoo. Um, again, one of my big concerns, Kalamazoo, fairly progressive city. A lot of the satellite cities around us, the rural areas, are be poo-pooing marijuana. I, I feel like we're going to become one of the major hubs in the state for cannabis business. But it needs to be done in a way that has both justice and equity. And if this means what I think it means, it could that could mean that the potential marijuana market in Kalamazoo, it could be a lot easier to establish that. But again, I don't. I don't want to. Uh, let's not start. Uh, you know, celebrating just yet. I really do want to dig into this first and figure out. Well, what still? Still, how much does it cost for the average person to get this license? <clears throat> uh, here's some more specifics about what these emergency rules mean. Uh, the state will allow medical marijuana and recreational marijuana to be sold in the same retail store as long as the products are physically separated. The rules allow for the temporary transfer of medical marijuana to the recreational market if the marijuana regulatory agency determines it is necessary and possible. However, officials aren't guaranteeing that will happen. <coughs> the rule also includes provisions for social marijuana use, including specific licenses for consumption at special events. Uh, something that comes to mind, I know uh, the folks down at Rupert's were talking about starting a marijuana lounge, so this is uh, very pertinent to them. <coughs> Excuse me. Marijuana smoking lounges will also be allowed, including at retail stores. However, those establishments will not be allowed to serve food or alcohol, Brisbo said. That's kind of a bummer uh, because, well, one, edibles, and two, uh, I can't think of a... I mean, that, that's a good business model if you're a restaurant slash uh, marijuana lounge because, as we all know, when you get really baked, it also makes you super hungry. So yeah, it's uh, kind of uh, cutting into some potential businesses. But, again, I'm sure a lot of the food vendors and restaurants in Kalamazoo uh, are probably quite happy to hear that. Um, officials have also created a new license type for marijuana growers who want to operate on a large scale in both the medical and recreational markets. The new license type allows growers to have more plants than is currently capped under state law. The Marijuana Regulation Agency is developing a social equity plan to help communities that have been disproportionately affected by marijuana prohibition and intends to release that later this month. 
And that last thing, I am definitely going to be keeping a close eye on that. Again, as we've talked about many times, equity is super, super important. Justice is super, super important. It is absolutely shameful that we still have uh, individuals in our Michigan prisons uh, who are basically there for the selling and distribution of what is now a perfectly legal plant. <clears throat> so, uh, again, we'll be keeping an eye on that. Very close eye on that, indeed. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, give me just a second, folks. I'm going to go let my co-host in. I'll be right back. back this is the hood rat strategist radio program now joined uh by my good co-host lawrence yep yeah what up people yeah oh so this, this rock music that you had playing is in the break though like this 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 uh this uh all, i don't know if that's alternative rock it's, i don't know what that uh, is it's like surf rock from outer space this is my friend's boron nuzzle uh ah. yeah <laughs> yeah that, like yeah that's a that's that's a little that's a little crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little out there stuff. I need to get some more background music because right now it's either like the the like the funky styling the stylings of Quantum Fleek or some like Quantum abstract <laughs> rock noise music. Yeah, um, we gotta get you. Yeah. Nah, we gotta get you some straight up. I gotta get you some. Uh, 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 what was it? Royalty free neo soul jazz and some funk. Yeah, like, like, there you there's go. Some, there's some um, there's some really good stuff on yeah. on Spotify and SoundCloud. Yeah. That you can uh, that you can uh, play. Oh, and quick plug: if you're a local band musician, you got some instrumental tracks that you'd like us to feature on air, just let us know. Send it our way. Or you got some dope house music. I mean, maybe yeah, maybe because I, I I'm trying to I'm trying to go to dance music. Was it dance? Uh, yeah, DMNY. DM, yeah. DMNY. I'm I'm gonna be out there. Uh, hopefully, I think it's what next week. Is it this uh, week? Or I think it's week? the 13th. Same day as the Black Arts Festival. Yes. Uh, yeah, Shout out some, to the Black Arts Fest. Yeah, go enjoy some Black Arts and then then go dance your butt off. Yes. Yeah, support your. So 
su- support your local black community, man. Black Arts Festival has has been around for I think it's gonna be I think it's for over fifty years. Oh yeah, yeah. it's uh it's gonna be at Lacron Park. It's a it's a smaller venue than being downtown and all these other things, but it's the entire week. They're going to be having stuff that's associated to the black arts. So I mean, I remember last year they had the silent party mm-hmm. where they had the headphones with oh, the multiple that was DJs. So cool. Yeah, that they, was they, that. they had multiple DJs. The different DJs were playing different music, and uh, and the headphones like and you could switch between the headphones and stuff. It was at the, it was at the epicenter. It was dope. It was super dope. Shout out to Yogi uh, uh, y- Yolanda uh, Lavender. Yeah. She, uh, she runs. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Black Arts and Cultural Centers. Mm-hmm. Shout out to all of them, man, because we need more things like that in our community all the time. And like the mm-hmm. Black Theater that that they, the Black Theater and art shows that they're going to be doing and all that stuff. So yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so I mean, I think it's good we talk a little uh, some positive stuff in the community. Um, do want to jump into so. Um, there was a story about the promise. We were also just talking, recapping a lot of the. Uh, um, again, I did that kind of goofy fascist rundown at the top uh, of the show. God. Yeah, we gotta we gotta talk about some of this American fascism. I do want to talk about the Kamazoo promise. Mm-hmm. Also, want to talk about. I, I know you was probably talking about the marijuana. The marijuana. Uh, yeah, yeah. I actually uh, just just talked about that a little bit. I don't know if you have anything uh, you wanted to add. Uh, I mean, I mean, <sighs> I want us to basically move closer to what Illinois and anything that helps us move closer to what Canada and Illinois is doing then I am happy about especially moving more towards what Canada is doing then I and I'm I'm definitely happy about I don't know I'm I want more uh people to not uh I'm 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 happy that it's becoming more mainstream to accept marijuana as as a, a, a as it as it is, and I get that. I the, the, the my main issue is that we see that it's only going to get that way when multinational corporations feel like they need to uh, when they can profit off of it. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. and that also locks out the fact that the people that's been disenfranchised and hurt. Because of the laws that we had on it, mm-hmm. are still going to be locked out, and it's still going to be made difficult for them to profit from it. Oh, do you ever know? Have you seen this? It's been making the rounds on Facebook. I can't remember the guy's name, but he's like, I think he's in Jackson Prison, but he's been there for like 35 years for marijuana possession. He's like this older black guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I can't remember the name, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I referenced like that a little bit uh, earlier too. It's just it's it's nuts to think that we're talking. To, like all of these these uh, capitalists are really salivating over this new market, and we've literally still got people in prison in our state for what is now a perfectly legal plant. I yeah. mean, I mean, Doug, it it it's, it's still happening in the country. There were stories. Uh, I remember watching. Uh, it was I think it was now this. You know how now this does those uh, mm-hmm. videos. There was a video of a a home. What was it? A stay at home mom selling edibles online. And she and she made like a million dollars last year. Like she grossed like a million and some change last uh, in one year. In that same year, Mississippi and Texas and Alabama and and Georgia were locking up like almost a million people for nonviolent drug offenses. In the same year, so in California, the stay at home mom made made a million plus. You know what I'm saying? Uh, off of off of selling edibles online, and brown and black people is getting locked up for the same thing. <laughs> oh yeah, like those 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 articles you see about like, oh, uh, people are starting to get into marijuana yoga, and it's like picture like two white women that. Mm, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I, I Siri, can you show me uh, white privilege, please? <laughs> yeah. No, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm happy that they're doing that. That's cool. Can we also keep that same energy for Jason, uh, DeAndre, and uh, and Shauna that's down the street, you know what I'm saying, around the corner, growing it in their house because that's one of the only ways they can supplement their income because they're working two, three, they're working two jobs that's not making enough money for them to survive. That's right. That's mm-hmm. that's all I, look, if you want to have marijuana yoga, if you want to do, um, if you want to sell edibles, if you want, uh, 
if you want to do all that and you're a white person, you want to open up a business, you want to make a Starbucks version, uh, a Starbucks version of a marijuana coffee shop where you can go buy marijuana, smoke it there and chill out. That's cool. Can we keep that same energy for the uh, disenfranchised black and brown people in America that want to create those same type of businesses and enjoy that same type of freedom? Mm -hmm. That's all. That's all I ask for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you know what? Uh, it's about six thirty right now. So why don't we do this? Let's uh, go ahead. I gotta play a PSA. When we come back. We're gonna dive in, talk about some of these deep issues. Uh, um, I, we got. Yeah. I, I wanted to personally talk about uh, Antifa, Antifa, the Antifa thing that happened in Portland, where the alt with the alt right, the 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 uh, far right journalist that got assaulted, and the lie of the milkshake being mixed concrete and stuff, yeah. which was a lie, mm -hmm. but also a, uh, the left wing, the left uh, our people attacking journalists. Is not cool. Like both things need to be addressed at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I hear that. So yeah. uh, we'll be right back. This is the Hood Rat Strategist Radio Program, only on eighty nine point one WIDR Kalamazoo, your only source for political revolution. Listening to 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo, your only source for radio evolution. Voting is important. From deciding Kalamazoo's best drunk food to picking the fan favorite for Wider's Battle of the Bands, voting allows people to voice their opinions and change their world. To vote for offices such as mayors, senators, and the president takes a little more than a link to a Google Form survey. Before you vote, you have to register. This can be done in person, by mail, and in many states, online. For more information, you can point your favorite web browser to vote.gov. All right, we are back. This is the Hood Rat Strategist radio program, only on 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo. So I think, like, oh, Lawrence I to, was... Uh, I forgot to share, I forgot to share that, um, oh. that word that it's radio time on my on my Facebook. Oh, do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, forgot, I forgot all about it. Yeah. Oh, it's I forget over. every yeah. time. Every time I'm like, we're, oh, it's radio time. Yeah. Oh, oh, darn, I forgot to talk about how we're on the radio right now. So uh, I want to, let's talk a little bit about what happened in in Portland. There was another high profile clash between uh, uh, Antifa and uh, what was it? Proud Boys or I can't remember. Oh, yeah, it was Proud. It was Proud Boys. It was yep. Proud Boys and some mm -hmm. other far right group. So there's there's three main things that have come up in the public's consciousness. One, there's this picture of this old guy who's just been assaulted, floating around. Uh, particularly a lot of conservative circles it's like see see this is the violence of of the antifa um also um this rumor being spread about them throwing uh uh milkshakes full of wet cement in them uh and uh, also uh, a some of more valid uh cr criticism about them assaulting a right wing journalist so I did want to break down a couple things here uh, I think all of these fall under the rubric of you know, uh, it, it feels to me like, you know, conservative media and kind of the centrist media are allowed to 
run with the, these lies and report them as fact. So let's mm, like yeah, look pretty much the context of the old guy who got assaulted. You see that picture of his bloody face. What you don't see is the picture of him before with a uh, he has a baton, like a police baton, and he's going around threatening to whack people with it, assaulting people. And again, 9.9 times out of 10, anytime you see a conservative who's been assaulted at one of these rallies, it's because they instigated it. It's, yeah. it's not just, it's not just, it's the Steven Crowder effect, how Steven Crowder pushed down the, the dude in uh, Michigan, uh, the, the union worker in Michigan, and then feigned surprise when the when he pushed down the union worker in Michigan and then he the dude from Detroit got up and hit him with a right. Yeah, right. yeah dude, you just you just like you started the fight. Mm-hmm. Now we're fighting. You yeah. wanted you wanted said smoke. I'm obliging you. Mm-hmm. Which is also the problem that I have with not just the uh what, what happened in Portland, the uh the journalists uh um, the journalist that the right wing journalist I forgot his name. Uh, Andy Ingo. Yeah. Uh, the right, the right wing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the right wing journalist. Not who got, to be confused with me, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the right wing journalist who got milkshaked and then punched in the face. Like, look, I understand the urge to punch Nazis in the face. I get it. I understand. I, I trust me. I debate with myself all the time that if I ever saw a Nazi and a Nazi got in my face, I debate all the time. Like I'm, it's like Kermit on my shoulder. It's like Kermit and Malcolm X is on my shoulder. Kermit in the hoodie, and my Martin Luther King is on the shoulder with Kermit sipping tea. So it's like I, I go back. I go back and forth. So I get it. The problem is this: one. When you, when we on the left attack, uh, uh, right wingers, especially far right, proud boys, and things of that nature, when we are, when we are the ones instigating the attack, or or no, no, not not instigating, when we are the ones that like for the the journalist, the journalist in particular, not the old guy with the baton, yeah. but the right wing journalist, one. The left attacking journalism when we have a president who says he wants to scale back libel laws and he and we have literally had pipe bombs sent to journalists because of the right wing. You're giving them legitimacy for them saying that the left wing attacks right uh, the right wing people. So one, you're giving them legitimacy. Two, you've lost the moral high ground because the because mainstream media is going to say, hey, look, they throw milkshakes on people. They hit people with cars. It's all the same because well, they're being yeah, violence. I mean, that, that false equivalency is important too. No, uh, no, but the, well, but the, I'll let the, you finish. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm talking. No, I agree. again, the false equivalency is a real thing that they're going to do because they've already been doing it. The third thing is this. The third thing is that you have you you are giving the right wing journalists because he went on reliable sources right after right after the whole incident. You're giving him now more platform to spread said lies and propaganda when we can, when you can peacefully say, yo, your views are garbage, you are garbage, and uh, you can, uh, you're, uh, and you can do a protest very similarly to Martin Luther King, to X and others saying that we will defend ourselves but we are not going to start the fight. You you don't want to lose the moral high ground because that's when the, uh, society will no longer be on your side. You don't want to lose. You don't want to uh, start. You don't want to start said violence because the right will always be more violent yeah. than us by nature. And yeah. also, okay, let's do some role reversal. Would you be okay if a right winger? Was to then if you're throwing if they're we're throwing milkshakes on right wing journalists for them to throw bricks or something else at left wing journalists or send pipe mm-hmm. bombs or something yeah. because if you're okay with that level of public shaming then you have to be okay with however they respond you can't control how they're going to respond but you have to keep that same energy mm-hmm. if you're not then you know what you're doing is already wrong. Yeah, and you know, I I do agree with that. Uh, you say, you know, the thing is, like, I I'm a huge supporter of uh, anti-fascist tactics, um, 
But I think there, there needs to be a certain discipline about what, okay, you're anti-fascist, who is under the fascist umbrella? Because uh, I think there's a big difference between reactionaries and outright fascists. Now, I got to say, I don't know the full context of this. I'm not sure, like, what, what outlet um, this, this Andy Ingo works for. He works uh, for like he works for he works for all of the troglodyte right wing groups. Like I, yeah. if I if I, I went through I went through some of yeah. the uh, plays. Like he works yeah. for like a Breitbart and some of the other and some of the oh, other. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. He's he is a far yeah. right mm-hmm. writer. Yeah. And then he's also he also wrote about the mm-hmm. incident. He said that they had liquid concrete that was yeah. in said milkshake. Yeah. Which would oh, and, yeah. and mm-hmm. also the Portland police also made a tweet saying that it was liquid concrete that was in the milkshakes without actually giving any because evidence of especially as we'll talk about later um you know the uh, a lot of law enforcement agencies uh, there's a lot of overlap between them and white supremacist groups um, especially the portland yeah. police like portland yeah. police in particular yeah. uh i know that we're going to get yeah. into it but mm-hmm. a lot of portland police support the far right and oh, all yeah. right groups yeah and uh, i do like i wanted to mention too you know the uh I think as far as this goes, um, yeah, this Andy Ingo guy, I'm sure he was being obnoxious and stuff. Maybe that's a milkshake, but I don't think that owes outright assault. Cause, um, they uh, punched and kicked him as yeah. they threw said milkshake yeah, yeah. on them. Yeah, you, you shouldn't do that because, like you said, it just it adds credence to this idea. Um, I think um, it finally happened. I'm not going to dive too deep in the article, but... Um, uh, and I'm not exactly sure if this is a new article or if this is old news, but... Um, the uh, the government has accused or er, um, sorry has deemed uh, anti-fascists uh, the the group anti-fascist antifa as a uh, um, domestic terrorist organization, which is funny because it's neither a terrorist uh, uh, nor an organization at all. It, again, it's uh, antifa refers to a tactic, not it doesn't not have a top-down structure. Uh, this actually reminds me of this um, very. Uh, this this post going around that I think sums it up very well. Um, fascists crow about quote unquote who funds Antifa because they are projecting their own activists' organizational structure. Antifa does not have a hierarchy of command, shadowy, shadowy big money funders, paid activists, law enforcement collaboration, or mass media outlets, but fascists do. Yep. No, 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 I here's the thing, I don't I. I, I fade sometimes on Antifa. I support I support Antifa because we need people to stand up against fascism. I get that. And being an anti-fascist, fighting against people who ideology is anyone who is a minority or is different from the uh, ideal human being, which is blonde hair, blue-eyed white people, should be eliminated from human existence because that's what fascism literally wants. Yep. I get that. And we need people to fight against that. However, it's in the tactics of how you fight against it that matters. Um, there's a reason why uh, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, the Black Liberation Movements, and things of that nature. There's a reason why they won. They won because they made sure that their tactics were superior, so that the uh, community and the overwhelming majority of America would be on uh, overwhelming majority of their society would be on their side. Now, I do, I do again, and this is me, us going back and forth on saying that, yes, I agree with you defending yourself. Mm-hmm. And I agree with self-preservation. I do agree that, uh, you, we should be, that we should be publicly shaming people. But at the same time, when you, it's, it's in how you escalate and do said tactics that, mean, that will give credence to what, they will, that what the other side will respond with. I mean, I, I agree with that to a certain extent, Lawrence, but at, at, at the same time, I mean, the right wing will say anything. I mean, they they, they, they will they'll call Nancy Pelosi a communist, which is about as far from no, 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 no. honest as you can get. But uh, just, yeah, we're, yeah, let yeah, me go, 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 finish go. this thought. Um, I think it's important to understand, like, the broader context, uh, you know, like anti-fascism, although it's kind of common to the, the public um, canon in the last couple of years. 
Uh, American anti-fascism has a very long history, especially in the 30s and 40s. You'd have uh, groups that would go around and find, uh, you know, kind of these German, uh, or not German, but uh, Nazi sim- sympathizer groups. It's a great story of like uh, these primarily like Jewish uh, anti-fascist groups in New York who would break up Nazi meetings by like basically throwing in stink bombs and then clubbing the hell out of them on the way out. Oh, uh, that's, that, that's not, that's <laughs> not cool. Dog. That's not cool. Man, I guess bro. Nazis throwing that stink that, bomb. Yeah. That's just, not dog. That's not cool, bro. <laughs> <laughs> that's not cool. No, no. Here's the thing. Do I, do I, in my soul again, I agree with it because they're Nazis, but at the same time at within that same token, if there was a if there was a black, uh, uh, would we be? We're not. You're not okay with them responding with a firebomb on the black church. But I mean, if that, a black, if but a that's bla- not if a, hypothetical, uh, Lawrence. They already are. No, no, they, no, they, no, they, no. They, but they that's, no, that but that no, but yeah. that's my point. The the I I get that I get that violent violence. If violence begets violence, then then you then we will get into this notion where the overwhelming majority of Amer- of, of Americans who are overwhelming majority of people who are on the far right who go to these protests armed with guns and things of that nature who want to pop off are going to then do so against counter protests who are not armed like that. And also at this, and also when we talked about this as well, um, over of uh, there is a portion of the police. That agree with the far right, which will then back their side. The, uh, we uh, there was a, the stories of, of the uh, Portland police officers helping organize uh, alt rights uh, alt right groups to make sure that they uh, can march through uh, pride parades, to, uh, sharing sharing information about uh, Antifa and other social justice fighters. Uh, their their houses, their uh, their housing mm-hmm. information, things of that nature. Even the border patrol, which was a story that I know that we wanted to get to, uh, uh, were are sharing are having groups group chats of of sharing pictures of AOC being sexually assaulted by Donald Trump, saying mm-hmm. that if they died, uh, th- if they died, then let them die. They these are heinous, horrible people. That if you that if again, if we are inviting violence towards them, they will respond in kind, and they are more heavily armed. And if your response is, then we should be heavily armed too. Then, then, uh, then one, you're saying that the logical conclusion of we should be armed and fight back too is we're gonna have literally gangs in New York style bloodbaths in in the streets. Well, I mean. One, I, I would agree. I, I I would say it's more like armed self defense. You don't go looking for a fight, but if the fight comes to you, you should defend yourself. I right? again, I are and I already conceded that notion. Yeah, okay. I are yeah. I already conceded that yeah. if smoke comes to you, then make sure that you uh, defend yourself. But at the same time, you do not create. Uh, you you can protest, you can yell, you can shame people, but as soon as you cross that line of 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 giving the agitators what they want, which is escalating violence, they will respond with yeah. bigger force and I violence. Mean, one of the, one of the reasons I advocate like being very selective about who you call fascist is America. I mean, we've been inundated with reactionary propaganda for, since for for decades, and especially in the last couple decades since uh, you know uh, Fox News and the explosion of the kind of segmented media atmosphere where people kind of they get the news they want to hear they don't get necessarily the truth um and we have to hold out hope or at least make the attempt we've got to try to convert people to a way of thinking that unites particularly working class people against the rich because they they want they want our society to be kind of bifactorated in this way that it's like the red versus blue liberals versus conservatives and the all right plays into that very well and you have to be very careful about who you you know you exercise that community self defense against because again there are a lot of people who you know they've heard they've you know gotten a lot of bunk information they're maybe on this uh, this you know right wing uh, uh, kind of alt right treadmill we gotta hope to take them off that treadmill and if you go and like hit them unprovoked 
that's not going to that might make them stay home and not go to the next protest but that's also going to solidify their views that, which is not good in the long run that all that also adds to the fact that they are more likely to join the other side because i got hit by the people who say that i'm that i'm being racist and stuff when i could have a conversation with them and tell them yo your views are garbage and these are the reasons why also when you talked about facts um Portland police came came out with a story saying that these uh, milkshakes were mixed with uh, quick drying cement, and there were other right wing and media sources saying that it was like an acidy substance. Uh, even though Media Matters, Media Matters, shout out to Media Matters because they are awesome, um, debunked this, saying that Portland police, even though they put out that tweet, did not show any evidence of said mixed concrete. Which also talked to the people who uh, they also interviewed the group of the people who mixed it saying that it was coconut milk uh soy milk it was coconut milk soy milk and uh rainbow sprinkers and they called it stonewall milkshake because of it's because of those uh of the stonewall um the, the, the anniversary of yeah. the Stonewall riots. Yeah, so. they called it the Stonewall milkshake because of the rainbow sprinklers, and they were saying that it was representative of what happened with the Stonewall uh, protest. So, when you hear things of that nature and you see the stories of it being an acidy substance, a none of them have none of them actually have uh, evidence to prove that it was acidy. It was an acidy substance, or uh, or it's solidified like quick drying concrete. B uh, the people who made the con- made those milkshakes also drunk some. So yeah. if they were uh, because they actually have video and, uh, and evidence of them doing so. So if there was quick dry cement in those in those milkshakes, it would be also in those human beings who drunk some. You know, it, it reminds me a lot, and I can't remember if this was Portland or Chicago, but the cops uh, they got a hold of. Uh, um, I think it was actually like a medic's gear, and they had like this bottle with this uh, white substance, and they were like, toxic substance con- uh, confiscated from far left protesters could be toxic. What it was, uh, it was a it was a Maalox mixture that people use. Uh, uh, basically, it's good. It, you put it in your eyes if you get pepper sprayed or tear gassed. Yeah, um, and it helps uh, alleviate uh, some of the pain. Um, but yeah, the police are trying to pawn it off as like some sort of toxic chemical that uh, you know the left wing protesters had on them so yeah again like it's a history of law enforcement uh, will lie and try to paint kind of leftist counter protesters as more inherently violent or agita- agitating than they actually are yeah so I mean so yeah so when we're talking about the narrative if you if you see things in the mainstream media if you see other people sharing sharing uh sharing it saying or even the portland police because the portland police cast kept the tweet up and they haven't shown any evidence of the sort if you see it it is a lie it is a absolute lie it's been debunked um if i could find it if you share if you after you share this uh share this on youtube i'm gonna see if i can find the find uh the media matters uh website uh article that debunks it but yeah there's a reason why where you get your information matters there's also a reason why uh when we how we protest and how we call out people who are garbage also matters so we need to have accountability of ourselves as well that's true Mm -hmm. but at the same and i'm not again this is not me saying don't fight back this is not me saying don't defend yourselves what i'm saying is Make sure that what we do does not detrimentally hurt the cause that we say that we care about. Because if we're using the same tactics as those that we are trying to, uh, if we're try, if we're using the same tactics as those as the oppressors that are hurting us, then the people who are who we want on our side, I. Uh, Will justify said violence on both sides. It goes back to that old, uh, what's that old uh, uh, homonym? A wise man said, "Never argues with fools because people from a distance can't tell who is who." Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, I hear that too, and uh, I think um, kind of to put a cap on this story, I think we need to describe a little bit more about. So the context we've talked about these reports coming out of Portland. 
what was going on in Oregon that, that kind of caused all this to pop off in the first place? So I, I wanted to yeah, read sure. this story and give you a little bit of context because this kind of flew under my radar as well. Um, th- the extent I did know about it, I was like, oh, oh okay, some right-wingers are doing some nonsense out in Oregon, doing some silly protests. The Republicans there like it. Uh, it was actually a little bit more uh, in in depth and kind of scary than that, actually. So I'm going to go ahead and read from that. This is a good summation of what happened. Um, this is from a post on the uh, uh, Sons of Liberty page. <clears throat> and uh, what it says... <clears throat> Excuse me. What it says is a summary of crisis in Oregon for people who haven't heard that much about it yet. Last week, Oregon's Democratic Party brought to its state Senate an overall pretty liberal bill that would make people pay a tax for the greenhouse gas emissions. They'd be the second state to pass the law after California. On Thursday, the 12 Republicans in a 30-person Senate decided to flee the state instead of voting on the bill, and 100 or so others proposed uh, for this session. This worked because 20 people are needed to hold a vote. The Democratic governor sent state police to find these senators, but unlike when Democrats walked out in the past, the police were, quote-unquote, unable to find any of these people. That seems a little dubious. Just talking about law enforcement collaboration. Uh, In response to this threat of police, right-wing terrorists offered to act as paramilitary bodyguards for the Republicans, an offer that was encouraged and accepted by multiple senators. The legislative meeting on Saturday was called off due to threats of right-wing terrorism that seemed to be celebrated by the official Oregon GOP Twitter account. On Tuesday, the Democratic Senate uh, president capitulated to the Republicans and terrorists, saying they would not pass the bill. The mainstream media has been pretty much silent about the Republican Party's open encouragement of terrorism and violence. The Democrats once again showed that even with all of the votes needed, they will fail to pressure and fail to pass the most basic legislation. Republicans use terrorism, Democrats let them win, and the news media didn't say crap about it. That was the guy who, that was the Oregon guy that threatened to, that's not the Bundy people that threatened to kill, uh, threatened to kill cops. No, this no. is a state representative. Yeah, well, this is like a, openly this, collaborating with basically like right-wing militia groups. Yeah, that's, this that's, is a, this is a state representative saying that if you come for me, I will come. I will. I will come out guns ablazing. This is a state representative. Mm-hmm. Let's have some fun. <laughs> what if Ilhan Omar would have said? Oh, oh, yeah. What? What? What if Ilhan Omar would have said? <laughs> would have said, "Yo, cops come for me." <laughs> well, it's like think I'm about it. It's I'm like I got the, some like Nation what? of Islam. <laughs> Wait, Dudes wait, here wait, with some AKs wait, who are going to be at my side protecting me. Yeah, what's the wait, response to that? Wait, wait, no, no, wait. Yeah, let let Elhan Omar come up with some battle bars. Talk about uh, let the cops come see me. I got a bigger nine. <laughs> like, uh, like, like, uh, also, like, 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 some battle rap bars. <laughs> like, just a mad. Okay, this is mad. It's mad, this is madness. Like, the reason why it's madness is because a. This is fa- the false equivalency of mainstream media will say, well, you know, he's a, he's a Republican. He believes in open carry, and he's going to defend himself because, you know, that's his constitutional these right. Are, these are just patriotic citizens deciding to come and help him out. And, you know, yeah, yeah, no, and that's, and, but, right, word. Second, this is, no, no, so that's the first thing. Second thing is uh, state, state police. This man just threatened you and your other colleagues. So when well, Republicans say uh, 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 "Blue Lives Matter," yo, what, yo, the Blue Lives Matter Republican people, my conservative people, a conservative representative said that he was going to kill cops. Well, you know, here's here's the thing about it, though. You know, I think what this kind of implies, though, the idea that the state police could not find any of the senators, whereas. Again, they said this has happened under Republican administrations as well, where they needed to find Democrat senators, and they found them right away. But they somehow mysteriously could not find any of these Republican sen- senators. So it's almost to me like it feels like there's a certain pageantry in saying, like, I'm going to stand my guns and I've got these militia guys who are going to help protect me. 
while at the same time the state police are like pretending that they can't find these senators. Right. When it goes back to that law enforcement collaboration we were talking about earlier. No, no. If 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 all right, so for one thing, if I was the uh, the governor of Oregon, I'd be like, look, either y'all can come and do your job or not. This bill, and I would tell, I would tell the the person who's the leader of the House of Representatives, call this to vote. If they're not there, they're not there. If they choose not to show up to work, they choose not to show up to work. That's their that's it's their fault. They're choosing not to re- represent their their constituents. That's their fault. Second thing, if I was the if I was the governor, I would like police chief. He just said that you and your boys won't do nothing. He just he just said that if y'all run up, y'all gonna get done up. What you gonna do? Are you are you really gonna let this are you really gonna let this man who uh who uh are you really gonna let these representatives this this representatives who's supposed to represent you uh, uh 12, 12 republican state senators yeah if these you're gonna let these state senators who are supposed to represent you disrespect you and your colleagues and you're not gonna go find them and the, as they hide behind you and they say that uh blue lives matter mm-hmm so you you're I'm like you're okay with that mm-hmm. you you you're okay with that all right <laughs> and you know one of the really distressing things to me about this too is uh, you know I might expect something of this over a really inflammatory bill like say it was a bill about gun control or, or abortion this was about greenhouse gas emissions it, it shows a certain amount of like there is such substantial buy-in uh, and collaboration between law enforcement these militia groups and you know the Oregon GOP that they will do this kind of overt terrorist activity over a piece of legislation that's pretty mild and tame. And, you know, here, here, to be clear, while, you know, a lot of, you know, on, like a lot of these kind of right wing militia types have ingested the anti climate propaganda pretty substantially, I can't think of a whole lot of them that would be willing to take up arms over. A, a freaking greenhouse gas tax. <laughs> you know. No, here's the thing. Here's the thing. We because of the uh, well, NDAA Act, uh, uh, our our, uh, and because of a lot of um, the the uh, the executive orders, like the Patriot Act and things of that na- of that nature, we don't have we don't have a uh, we don't have a Fourth Amendment. Uh, really, we. Uh, we have the First Amendment, but they want to, but they want to, but they are quelching that, but um, in multiple in multiple areas, uh, they uh, the Thirteenth Amendment is a thing, but if you're a, a, a convict, you're basically treated like a legalized slave. So the only thing that we do have back, uh, we have is the Second Amendment, which control our guns. But the people who have the guns will not fight to make sure that those other rights are actually being given to the people. And, and that's the problem that I'm having. That it's a, it's hypocrisy. I've I've met, I've actually bo- like a few uh, few of these right wing people in my circle. Uh, I'll get some absolute silence about this. It's like so y'all y'all are collecting arms uh, in case the government like starts uh, you know trying to steal people's land or like clamp down on our rights. Like yeah, brother. And I'm like, where were y'all at Standing Rock? Well, I was getting my my butt tear gassed. It was like. Crickets. crickets. Where, where, yes. where were you yeah. when? Where were you, where were you when? Uh, when multinational corporations are giving these people free bribes to pollute our water and air? Mm-hmm. Where are yeah. you? Where are you when it came to Donald Trump giving tax cuts to millionaires and billionaires, and they did not, and they did not give uh, you, the average person who's buying all these guns, a tax break? Mm-hmm. Where, where are you when it comes to uh, what's going on at the border? Where children and uh, families are sleeping on concrete, kids are dying, more immigrants are dying, and yeah. you're, what, you're okay with it? You know, actually, I think that's a good segue into our next story. Let's take a quick little break first, but yeah, when we come back, we definitely got to touch on some of the CBD stuff. Um, I know it's been blowing up uh, on social media and stuff, but again, like, this is, uh, it's, it's some stuff. So, we will be right back. This is the Hood Rat Strategist radio program, only on 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo. Hi, this is Fred Snyder of the 
the B-52s and the Superions, who were formerly the Del Morons. And every time I'm in Kalamazoo, I tune into WIDR. We are back. This is the Hood Rat Strategist radio program. Uh, so I actually just got a call. Wanted to let you know a little factoid. I think this just goes plays into more how how much uh, a lot of right wing media likes to BS about Antifa. But they talked. He said um, uh, basically when you mix cement with sugar, that prevents cement from actually congealing and uh, and solidifying. Um, again, it, it reminds me of uh, yeah. If you if you mix, I think it's like a pound of sugar with. Uh, or maybe even less than that, with a certain amount of cement, it could prevent... Uh, well, actually, like a lot of French anarchists used to do back, that back in the day with, to help prevent prisons from being built. So, mm. again, it just shows you the kind of like nonsense that comes from them. But we wanted to transition. Th- this next story, um, uh, you know, it, it was a bombshell dropped on... Was it Monday or Tuesday? I think it was Tuesday? Or Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, there's been a lot of talk lately, particularly about the atrocious conditions at the border. Um, we had a couple of pro- progressive politicians go down there um, this week, and you know, I'll, I gotta say, like last week, I remember it was like a lot of debates about like whether or not to call these places concentration camp. After reading and hearing this story, you know, to me, like one, not only yes, are they concentration camps, but we we've, we've gone far past this. The kind of cruelty. That was described by the, these Congress people. This is straight to like this is the kind of stuff that Hollywood writers put in World War II movies to show you how evil Nazis are. Yeah, it's like yeah, it's like comically, cartoonishly awful, evil crap. Doc, yeah. doc, uh, people not people going days without having a hot meal. People sleep on the floor. People having to drink out of the toilet. Be told to drink out of the toilet. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 you had you had grown men with guns being. No, the thing that pissed me off outside of outside of uh, Nancy Pelosi being absolutely horrible as a leader about said border patrol oh, and I'm stories glad you about that up. and yeah. and also uh her stories about how she wrote a letter to Trump which I also we also have to get into because Nancy Pelosi needs to go and Chuck Schumer needs to go but other than that these grown men who are at these concentration camps were crying about how AOC and how Ayanna Presley was talking to them about the uh, conditions at the uh, at the facility, and they got all in their feelings, saying that these women threaten uh, was threatening them. She's like five really? four. She's like five four, 135 pounds. You're a grown man, and you have body armor and a gun. See, I like, didn't hear this you, piece of it. Like, so okay, so what's like the fair play here? You're allowed to like, you know, uh, threaten to sexually assault a congressperson on social media all the live long day, but if they you if they talk to you in a stern manner, that's no, just too remember, much. Remember, no, 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 <laughs> no. Remember, there was a, a breaking news. I think it was the New York Times or Washington Post that broke the story about the about the group, the the uh, group chat that had a overwhelming majority of border patrol agents in it. They they had comments like. Uh, we should start a GoFundMe page for anybody who throws a burrito at one of our, uh, for one of the Congress people that come there. And we should start a GoFundMe if someone, uh, actually does that. Or, 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 and, uh, 
And then when they had uh, Ayanna Presley, who was giving a speech after seeing what she saw, and you had far right nutcases screaming and yelling at her bigoted racist things because they don't care about the lives of the human beings inside of the private prison that was making money off of their suffering. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, so. Let's look at the levels The levels of insanity we have here We have people who are crossing the border They are crossing the border Because of foreign policy Of the war on drugs And other and other geopolitical politics That the United States has done To cause chaos in their country mm-hmm. yep. uh, again. They, they yeah. are crossing the border Because they are seeking asylum And instead of And instead of Helping them like uh, no, like the people with no more deaths. Shout out to the shout out to the organizers and people at no more deaths. Oh, and by the way, they're trying to bring that guy to court again, yet again yeah. after the mistrial. Oh but, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that, that and we gotta get to that story too. But instead of helping them with food and water and helping them seek asylum, even though it is a misdemeanor to cross the border, instead of treating them like human beings we're putting them in cages having them sleep on the floor uh our taxpayer dollars are going toward them getting uh aluminum blankets sleeping on the floor not getting toothbrushes toothpaste or uh getting soap or water having them having the parents ripped from their children and then and and also and some of them dying because of the conditions and then after that congress men and women go down there and they are told that they cannot record or they cannot and the media cannot record of what's going on inside the facilities and even after they clean it up cuz they want to make it presentable for the congressmen and women the guards are dehumanizing the people and the uh in the congressmen and women they are uh, berating and uh, dismeaning to the pe- uh, to the children there. I-, I believe one of the women that AOC talked to described it as psychological warfare. Like the cop, uh, the the uh, ICE uh, or no, uh, sorry, the Customs and Bol- uh, Border uh, Patrol thugs would like turn the lights on and off and at odd times through the night call them whores. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. So they keep the lights on while they're trying to sleep. They uh, are not given proper food, education, or actually warmth and shelter. On top of all that, the private prison is being funded It's by American taxpayer dollars. And there are, so, there are corporations making money off of this. So, yeah. so, so, so here, here's my thing. Here's my thing. We were having a discussion. We were we we had a discussion weeks ago about uh, I forgot I forgot what the amendment was that said taxpayer dollars should not be allowed to go to abortions and things like that. Remember we were we were having that what was it the Hyde Amendment? We were talking about yeah. that, right? Mm-hmm. If taxpayer dollars, uh, okay, so and that was a Republican bill. If taxpayer dollars is going towards. The, uh, uh, we can we can allocate or reallocate taxpayer dollars to go to things that we don't support. Then why don't we take that money instead of giving it to those private prisons for those people to be sleeping like roaches and animals? Why don't we take that money and we can give that money to hotels or yeah. or other or uh, or other hostile places like bread and breakfasts mm-hmm. for these people? And we can use our taxpayer monies to do that instead of the prisons. It would actually be cheaper to house these people humanely. Um, with again, uh, when you actually look at the numbers at this, it's they're giving these people bare minimum. I think it's like uh, the average cost is something like seven hundred and seventy per person per day. Is that if I'm yeah, correct? Something like that. Yeah, and they're barely getting any food, any rations. So where is that extra like? You know, seven hundred and fifty dollars, seven hundred and sixty dollars a day going. It's, it's going to all these private contractors who are using this this human rights atrocity for personal profit. Yeah, uh, that's, and, yeah. and and this is this is the this is the other thing. This is the other thing. Well, uh, there's there's a couple different things outside of the things that uh, 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 that outside of what we just laid out. Uh, one, the media and Congress. 
not being allowed to videotape or show what is going on is the personification of what Noam Chomsky was talking about when he came manufacturing consent, controlling mm-hmm. what you see. Yep. Because mm-hmm. if you remember, the reason why a lot of Americans were, uh, was against the war in Vietnam because they kept showing the castings coming back uh, every night on mm-hmm. the news. So they kept showing that it was our people dying in a war, in an offensive war in a country that did not attack us. So, so if I control the narrative of saying you cannot videotape what's going on in here because it looks like a concentration camp, and these uh, and the stories that uh, the stories that we've heard are actually worse than what uh, then is actually worse when you see them. You are we we as human beings are much more affected by what we actually see than just what we hear, then it makes those things real. It makes mm-hmm. it makes the treatment of those other human beings a much more of a reality for us when we see it. Absolutely true. The yeah. problem so this is the other issue. Outside of the fact that Nancy Pelosi gave gave Donald Trump the money to keep to keep this nonsense going. Yeah, I do. Um, I, I just want to expand on that. You know, um, that is something that hasn't caught as much attention. At the very same time, all of this was going on, being exposed. The kind of a reaction or answer to this from Nancy Pelosi, uh, Pelosi and to a certain extent Chuck Schumer was basically negotiate with the Trump administration and say uh, we want better communication uh, about when people die in ICE and uh, CBD custody. No concrete reforms to deal with the actual atrocities going on in these camps. That's your that's your resistance, uh, ladies and gentlemen. That's your opposition. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. It, it was much. It was not just we want more communication. It was we're going to give you more money for border patrol, and we're going to give you more money mm-hmm. towards you building your stupid yeah. ass wall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, instead of us saying. You need to fix the conditions or we're not going to give you this money. Yeah. They gave them the money and then she wrote a stern letter said, at your earliest convenience, can you uh, <sighs> can you please consider yeah. what we're talking about? Yeah. That's like that's like your that's like your brother or sister getting kidnapped. You giving the money to the kidnappers and saying, hey, will you now? Uh, hey, can we now negotiate you bringing my sister or brother back? Oh, wait. Y'all didn't bring my sister no, or brother no. to the, oh, to the meeting. Come on, man. I gave you all that money. You're not acting in good faith. Yeah. Man. So, <laughs> again, uh. this is the reason why this infuriates me. Because AOC, uh, I think Ayanna Presley, I think Joe Lewis and some other and some other actual fighters went down there to see what was going on so they they can speak to what can be fixed and how we can fix them yet the leadership in the democratic party does not have a backbone or actual leadership skills to actually demand these things to be changed especially think about like the the the, like the, the the contrast there you have aoc going into a place where like you know like it just literally drops the same day oh by the way like half of this agency are sharing these memes and jokes about you being assaulted. Um, so you're going to a place with people who are comfortable um, with potentially assaulting you. Uh, Ayanna Presley, who she ends up giving this speech uh, to to the press to uh, a huge consortment of like all of these kind of racist reactionary protesters came out to try to drown out her press conference, and she just. Powered right through anyway. Oh man, these it people was... have actual like you know. Let's let you know put, setting aside like you know politics or you know whatever. These people have actual genuine courage. All at the same time, Nancy Pelosi is on Capitol Hill, giving like just this weak ass sauce, mealy mouthed answer to this concentration camp crisis. Yeah, yeah, it's it shows you what happens. When you used to take money from the private prison industry, it shows hey, you it yep. shows you what happens when you're when you're more concerned about making money off of the crisis than actually fixing the conditions for the human beings in said crisis. 
And it's not just Nancy Pelosi. It, this also falls on Chuck Schumer. Because yeah. Chuck Schumer could have been like, uh, we ain't passing this bill. Is there any language of you fixing this problem? Mm-hmm. Oh, no, we're not passing this bill. Yeah, I think, it, you know, I'm glad you brought that up, Lawrence, because let's keep in mind, and, you know, it, it's uh, these facilities existed before Trump got into office. And for a lot of Democrats who get money from these these kind of companies that benefit from this. Geo they, Group and all those. Yeah, they would prefer that these facilities existed after the main, the core problem is um, the level of cruelty and mistreatment. Um, it's gone to a point where the American public in general can't ignore it. But uh, you know, politicians like you know Nancy Pelosi and stuff—they have to walk this tenuous line where they would prefer to go back to the good old days where we could have these kind of camps and facilities that were a little bit more humane, but still made money for their donors. But you know, again, it's like uh, they don't want to. What's I'm sorry. What's the um, don't want to? They don't want to overturn the apple cart. Yeah, exactly. And mm-hmm. and I mean, I mean, let's talk about. I mean, I, I like this quote from Jimmy Dore, and Jimmy Dore makes me laugh. Uh, and I like this quote. He was like, "There's already walls in a building. There's already walls uh, on in, on uh, to com- to complete a building. You have to have walls that connect. The only reason why you would have cages." Steel cages is if you're trying to cage people. Is yep. if, if if you're trying to treat them like they're prisoners, mm-hmm. and also this also goes to Fox News. Um, the dude I forgot the guy's name who's on Fox and Friends. Uh, I I don't know his name. I forgot his name. He's a troglodyte. Comparing the concentration camps to a house party with too many guests means that you don't see these human beings as uh, other human beings. You see them as inconveniences. Uh, as, you see them as people that are that inconvenience you like at a party. Let's also remember the fact that they're not at a party. They're not at the Four Seasons. They're not at the Radisson. Mm-hmm. They're in they're in buildings sleeping on the floor with uh, with aluminum blankets. So, so comparing them, comparing it to a uh, wild party, bruh, was one of the dumbest, idiotic things I heard this week. Like it, it lit. Like I was listening to it while I was at work. I almost threw my phone out the window because yeah. I was oh, that man. angry. Mm-hmm. I was like, "What the?" F-? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Lawrence, got a quick question for you. Um, yeah. Uh, are you gonna have to cut out of here at uh, seven thirty, or be here till the end of the show? I can I can stay till the end of the show. Okay, great. Um, I just I was thinking about like what topic we wanted to jump on next. There's a couple of things back locally I want to talk about. Uh, Snyder turned down the Harvard thing. Uh, there's the Kalamazoo Promise story. There's also um, the Democratic debates just happened. Oh, um, I did yeah. want to. Cap off. Um, I, I I don't I don't mind defecating on Snyder. I uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, de- uh, Snyder needs all. Snyder Snyder needs all all of that oh, negativity. Yeah. He he deserves it. Uh, in the same year that he poisoned a major a major city in uh in uh, uh, Michigan. He, him, and his administration killed more people than the actual Taliban that oh, year. Oh yeah. So yeah. let's not. So let's not. Mm-hmm. So let's not let that go because Flint still doesn't have clean drinking water. That's right. And it's because of him. So uh, mm-hmm. I think like when we get back, we'll kind of talk about the, that uh, uh, mi- uh, kind of trio of topics. Um, let's end Let's yeah. end with the debates because my God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my God. Wait, do you want to talk about the do you want to talk about the debates right now? Or? No, no, we, we okay. can end with the debates. All right. Because okay. because. Man, <laughs> oh, there right. was some gar, yeah. there was some wonderful moments, yeah. and then there was some garbage. Yeah. Uh, all right. <laughs> um, before we go to break, I did want to mention there was one last uh, story in our when we were tough, to- uh, kind of our overview of fascism and anti-fascism. I forgot to talk about, um, and I think this is very pertinent because this is we've talked about um, uh, the local this local pack of hooligans here in Kalamazoo. Um, but I wanted to really bring it home, you know, one of the problems, uh, particularly the group uh, Proud Boys, who try to kind of 
come off as like more kind of center or acceptable than your average like neo-Nazi, etc. Um, they are basically a violent gang, and the, this story out of Philadelphia really exemplifies it. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of read a little bit from this. Uh, there are two Philly residents. Um, this is uh, Gwen Snyder. She's an independent journalist. Said there are two Philly residents, myself included, who received terroristic late night visits from a crowd of gun toting Proud Boys uh, and a third being uh, threatened. They actually flew people uh, into Philadelphia for this. Uh, um, and uh, this, is, this is from like their kind of the Proud Boy message board. And they're talking amongst themselves. They say, stay tuned uh, for info on a few of uh, Philly's biggest uh, uh, S stains coming soon. We're going to need everyone's help. Um, uh, there's this guy, C. Black, in Philadelphia, who's like a Proud Boy organizer there. Uh, so just got into Philly. No any foot greeting for me. Kind of disappointed. About to meet up with some boys who are proud. They're going to make up. Make, we were, uh, they were going to uh, up late making house calls. Going to give us the tour and the lay of the land. Um, and uh, talk about having the address of uh, these, these organizers and journalists. Um, again, another person... Talked about this not to be alarmist, but after being suspended from Twitter on four other accounts, this guy is now saying he's flying out to uh, at LA and Otis with guns in tow. Apart from spouting endless anti Semitic garbage, this is actually a threat on someone's life. Um, uh, again, Gwen, Gwen Snyder went on to say the Proud Boys plan these terroristic home visits for weeks. They're making gun threats, they're flying people in from out of state. They came to our houses in armor. My friend had four young children at home. This is terrorism. Uh, apparently 20 people showed up to her friend's house, apparently planning to attack him, and they've been threatening to show up armed at Ellie and Otis's home for weeks. Um, this is called so, uh, like, this isn't stochastic terrorism. This is, this is uh, not stoking the flames of someone to incite violence. This is them literally walking up to people's house this is no different than when the Ku Klux Klan used to burn crosses in people's yards. Yes, it, it's very like, it, similar. It, 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 it is a, it is just swap the, the white robes for those stupid black polo shirts. But <laughs> yeah, it, it, but but here's here's the problem. Here, here, here's the problem. Um, I wish that when the story came out, that they videotaped these people coming to their house. Because uh, some of them did, did get footage actually. No, 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 no security no. cameras. Yeah, no, no. But that, but this is the thing though. There's a reason why the KKK was smart enough to wear hoods, because if you yeah. live, because <laughs> if you live in that community, you can get retribution for doing said dumb things when you have footage or video of them doing so. And it's because of modern technology. We can videotape, uh, share, and all those things, and then you will go viral so that the police in the community have to do something about it. So, show up, yes, yeah, show up to show up to somebody's house, especially in Philly. Show, <laughs> show, show up to like, and also notice these proud boys will go to white liberal houses <laughs> that don't have guns. Yeah, that's right. Please know these guys in the hood. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Please note that they never go. They don't go to East Philly. Yeah. They don't go to West Philly. They, they they're not they're not going to where they're not going to where um to Gilly the Kid and Meek Mills and Black Thought. They ain't going to where they used to live. They're going to the white suburban uh, places of Philly so that they can act like they're really tough. Without actually getting retribution, yeah. But mm -hmm. I guarantee you, let them bring that smoke, like like the like the little group of proud boys that's in Kalamazoo. Mm -hmm. Let them bring them smoke to the north side. Yeah. <laughs> let them bring that smoke to the <laughs> or, south or side. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, let them, let them bring that smoke to the people who want smoke. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I would even say to a certain extent, uh, the vine too. There's a there's a reason all those anti-fascist stickers are up and about. You know, and uh, you're at least gonna get a bat to the face. That's all. Oh, I'm gonna Dog, yeah. Like, no, yeah. like I, I would hate for yeah. the Proud Boys to feel like they are comfortable enough walking around student ghetto. Like, yeah, I, no, like, no, yeah. like, <laughs> like, 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 look, like, like, look, I, I ain't look again, again. 
I am I'm a nonviolent person. I believe in I believe in the methods of Martin Luther King, and I tell, and I talk about this all the time. Every time we have a discussion about it, I'm oh, all, yeah. I always lean to the size of nonviolence. And, but at the same you know, time, uh, I will say full disclosure myself. Like I am also uh, you know I've participated in a lot of like nonviolent civil disobedience. I do believe in that. I just, yeah, yeah, no de-escalation. Yeah. No de-escalation yeah. is an amazing thing. We need to teach it to our cops. Here's we, the problem. We really do. Yeah. No, no, but here's the problem. Again, if if smoke. Is being brought your way, and violence is being is being brought towards you, especially when it comes to people like the Proud Boys, and you and you're in a situation where you can defend yourself and walk out alive. Then please make sure that you defend yourself wisely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like let's not let's yeah. not we I'm not ask I'm not I'm not advocating for people to start fights. I'm asking I'm advocating for people to de escalate. Yeah. But yeah. if violence is being brought onto you, please make sure that you get home safely. Yeah, and I guess that was another reason I really wanted to bring this story up. Just kind of like duty to warn type of thing. Because I know there are elements, there are groups like this that operate in Kalamazoo. And uh, well, just, remember they they, yeah. they sprayed the swastika on the north side. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. They sprayed they sprayed swastika on the north side in the middle of the night. Well if they, if they were here they'd probably be like allegedly okay. We yeah, yeah, allegedly, 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 but mm-hmm. it was in the yeah. It was in the middle of the yeah. night where yeah. where uh, after they'd just been seen and like I think it was after they'd just been seen at Shakespeare's or something. No, no, yeah. they were at Louis. It was Louis. at Louis. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And I'm like, and I don't have no problem. Like again, I don't, I don't ask guys for violence. I live and let live, bro. But at the same time, if you are advocating for smoke, uh, if those if those people were really uh, about that life and they were really advocating for smoke, they would go to where people would love to give it. Yep. They don't they're mm-hmm. they're going to people who do, who's not about that life. All right, so I think let's go ahead. We're going to take a quick break. Uh when we come back, uh, again, we got some some more stuff to talk about. This is the Hood Rat Strategist Radio program only on 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo, your only source for political revolution. Are you the police? No, ma'am. We're DJs. 89.1 FM, Wider Syndicate. They're not going to catch us. We're on a mission from God. Using a cell phone while driving leads to 1.6 million crashes a year. Help us reduce that number by keeping your eyes off your phone and on the road. This has been a friendly reminder from Wider.
we are back. This is the Hood Rat Strategist radio program, only on 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo. Uh, so I wanted to update you all on a story that's been uh, stirring up some uh, a good degree of controversy uh, up here in the state of Michigan. Um, so uh, if you all haven't heard, uh, Harvard offered uh, Rick Snyder a job. Uh, oh, trash, 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 trash. trash. Uh, so, where's, where's our where's our soundboard to, <laughs> that has the Game of Thrones reference? Shame, 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 shame. 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 Uh, <laughs> so, okay, here's here's. Uh, I'll just do the quick, quick and dirty of it. But this is from an article in the Detroit News. Uh, Snyder did withdraw from that that Harvard post amid Flint backlash. Gee, you think there'd be a backlash, huh? Uh, so. Here's what it says. He's withdrawn from a planned one-year fellowship at Harvard following intense criticism of the appointment and continued outrage rage over the Flint water contamination crisis. Uh, he said, uh, while it would have been exciting to share my experiences, both positive and negative, our country's current political environment and its lack of civility would have likely created an environment that would be too disruptive at the Kennedy School, Snyder said in a statement posted on social media. I wish them the best in the coming academic year. Harvard had emphasized Snyder's advocacy of civility and politics as one of the reasons it chose him for the fellowship, but the appointment sparked swift and harsh online backlash, primarily from uh, the political left. Um, okay, so I'm, I don't know if I'm going to read much more of this, but... Uh, I think we can just talk about why this is so outrageous. Um, um, uh, Harvard, uh, y'all will not accept a kid because of his racist post that he made when he was back in high school. But you want someone to teach at Harvard who poisoned the city. Uh, by the way, this I'm disgusted with both like Harvard and... Um, Snyder for you know talking about this in terms of civility. Hey, 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 Lawrence, you know something that's really uncivil? What? Uh poisoning an entire city. Yes, yeah. that's, that's pretty uh, damn uncivil. Um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, multiple people died because of uh, of waterborne lead diseases uh, because of the actions of that administration. Now, Harvard was just in the news because of a conservative conservative kid, Parkland kid, that didn't get in because of uh, racist things that he was saying in a group chat to some of his friends. I agreed that Harvard should have been like, yo, some of the things that you've been saying were kind of racist. We don't want you around. We don't want you in our uh, around our people because that's not uh, uh, what we uh, are about. Even though they had warmongers and other people uh, uh, at Harvard and they denied Chelsea Manning from going to speak. But uh, yeah. outside of that hypocrisy, you have a man who literally has blood on his hands. There are hundreds of thousands of kids that have lead in their system because of him, and you're saying that he should be teaching? It basically re rewarded. They're saying, like, well, his experience, his successes and failures would be very instructive to the student body at Harvard. No, no, what? no, 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 no. Wait, 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 you, you want to, you want a teacher, uh, Mark Lamont Hill, I think, uh, should, could be teaching. Mm -hmm. Dr. Cornell West can be teaching. Get, uh, Angela Davis. She just got back from, uh, uh, the Palestinian, uh, she got, just got done being in Palestine talking about human rights. There are hundreds of teachers that are actually responsible human beings that actually care about human beings that doesn't have blood on their hands. Or better yet, you know, offer one of those fellowships posts to to like one of the one of the Flint organizers or like you know <laughs> so one of one of the intellectuals has been on the ground in Flint. Why offer it to a governor who, you know what? I, I think he should. There is a post that I think he's well deserving of. Um, it's over in in Jackson. I don't know if you're familiar with the institution I'm talking about. Yeah, no, uh, I am. Yeah, it's, no, uh, I am. Yeah, the, uh, the state prison. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah, I'm talking about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, but yeah, this dude doesn't deserve the, uh, um, Harvard. Y'all, Harvard, y'all are y'all are garbage for offering him a job. Uh, Rick Snyder, you're just a garbage human being that needs to uh, go wash your face in some Flint water. And I wish that when uh, when uh, Michael Moore did his documentary of uh, Fahrenheit, uh, what was it uh, Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit 9 11, 9 11 9, 
Or 11-9? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wish that you were at home when he sprayed the mansion, the governor's mansion with Flint water. Because I would have loved to see you get sprayed with that power hose. Mm-hmm. All right, now we're done. All right, All right. I'm, I'm, I'm done talking so, about it. Uh, so let's, let's slow down a little bit. Uh, this, this is not so much us uh, heating up Rick Snyder deservedly, but uh, we got uh, a little bit of press attention, and this is an issue we've talked about on the show before. I did want to, just because it was uh, the Wall Street Journal of all outlets actually brought this up. Um, so uh, basically what they report, um, they t- it's about... Uh, the Kalamazoo Promise, and they wrote an article about it. Um, so here, here's what they had to say: College enrollment has soared across all racial groups among all students who graduated from a KPS school, high school, uh, from 06 through 2017. 75 percent enrolled in college within six months, versus a national average of about 67 percent, and only 58 percent in Kalamazoo uh, before the program. But the barriers to finishing college are more than financial. Other handicaps are high rates of single-parent households, teen pregnancy, and homelessness. Uh, The most startling figures have to do with race. The rate of white students earning a bachelor's degree within six years of entering the program, uh, 46%, was triple that of the rate for black students, 14%. And among high school graduates from mid Uh, High-income households, defined as those not eligible for free or uh, reduced-cost school lunches, the percentage of students earning some kind of college credential jumped from 56 to 40, uh, from 43 percent, a contrast to the nearly unchanged figure for black students. Clearly, clearly, the Kalamazoo Promise is a great start, yet not all the barriers to completing college um, are financial. So, I I guess I'll let you know, like, uh, you know. You know, full disclosure, both me and Lawrence went to Kalamazoo Public Schools, uh, Norix and, uh, specifically, oh, and uh, we're the first class to receive this uh, this scholarship. Um, and again, you know, this is this is not a new criticism uh, from either one of us. This is something we've talked about on the show before, uh, but I just wanted to kind of recap, like, some of our thoughts on it. I don't know if you wanted to go first, Lawrence, uh, maybe kind of, especially your perspective, you know, again, uh, I grew up in the Edison neighborhood as a poor white kid. Uh, I will say something that um, I, I want to give some a shout out to a uh, friend Mimi, uh, Mimi Abdul uh, Bellamy. She pointed this out um, on a political page that I run. Uh, I, I kind of talked a little bit about this in depth, you know, kind of the shortcomings, and talked about how, like, you know, they said it was designed for you know poor folks like us, but there's just this huge gap between. Um, you know, uh, particularly for low-income folks. And um, while I didn't explicitly mention the racial gap, she was quick to point out, uh, you know, truthfully, it's also uh, the Kalamazoo Promise was kind of put in there to prevent white flight. So, yes, it is kind of an option in there for, you know, white working-class families, uh, you know, work white poor families. But, again, uh, there is this huge racial disparity that um, has been left really unaddressed and i think it's only been the last couple of years that people have really started talking about it i mean i mean the kalamazoo promise was a good was a good uh, i i still think that the kalamazoo promise is a good thing oh um, same, same yeah yeah yeah. um i uh i think that it's uh i think that it, it it's a it, it's a it was a small scale approach to a much larger problem I think that if we have things like uh, free college, uh, u- uh, universal free college and tuition for four-year universities, addressing the fact uh, that uh, at the same time as addressing the fact of uh, the, uh, the these people who will still need a living wage to survive, to buy books, to uh, to to deal with fees. Um, and things of that, and other things of that nature. It's it's uh, it's not just you need to spend money to go to these very expensive colleges. It's also you trying to survive while going. Mm-hmm. And that and that's and those are um, and to think that someone and to or to expect someone to still having to work a full time job or even a part time job and still be able to take full uh, full hours out of school. Uh, like 12 hours plus it's it's difficult it is excessively difficult and also 
I mean that that doesn't take away that doesn't take away from it needing to exist, but it also should have been a part of uh, a, a part of how to f- deal with the problem of some of its shortcomings. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, you know, definitely agree. I think there's more going to be done. I think like the structural problems with the promise relate back to, and this is kind of a model that happens a lot in Kalamazoo. It's uh, the the. You know, state programs, government programs that have been hollowed out by decades of neoliberalism. Local billionaires in Kalamazoo come along to pick up the tab, and whether they're doing it with any ulterior motives or not, because it's coming in the form of this sort of like, uh, you know, blank check um, that doesn't do the kind of, uh, you know, analysis and class need that, you know, government programs usually have to do out of their mandates. You end up having these disproportionate outcomes. Uh, I think another good example of it is like right out of the gate, Foundation for Excellence offers this property tax that just because of the reality of our city, history of redlining, um, is uh, far more beneficial for upper middle class white families than even middle class black families or especially like poor black families who don't own property. Um, but I think uh, with that, let's kind of put a, put a stamp on that. Want to talk about the debates? And I know, Lawrence, you're probably going to have a lot more to say about this than I will. I just want to kind of kick off with a few points. Um, full disclosure, I did not watch all four hours of the debates. I did watch a good, uh, good chunk of them. Um, I would say kind of as a political wonk coming out of it, I think, you know, Kamala Harris, Warren, um, Julian uh, Castro all had some really good performances. They were able to get some good ideas out there and use it as an opportunity to get their stuff out on the national stage. Um, I think more generally, uh, you know, one of the things I got to say, and this is, I guess this has been like kind of a general critique that as I've watched this primary gaining speed, and it's a point that I'll be making a lot, especially as we get closer to it in Michigan. I think if you're a part of like the socialist or anarchist left and maybe you only vote in terms of harm reduction. One of the things that I thought was really absent from those debates was talk about foreign policy. And I really got to tell all y'all, if we're if you're voting for harm reduction, you got to factor it in there. Because, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about this last week. You know, uh, Warren uh, and Kamala, Com- to their credit, I think they did, they did sign off. Um, There's a veterans group that asked them to pledge uh, to kind of stop endless wars. Again, I'd say that their records kind of say something different. And I got to say, when it comes down to the wire, if you're voting for harm reduction in this primary, you got to look at people like who who are the candidates who are promising not only to do these economic reforms that will improve people's lives, but also talking about harm reduction internationally. As far as I know, there's li- really literally only two candidates who've really stepped up and talked about that. Um, you know, that'd be Bernie uh, Tulsi Gabbard and, and Gravel, but he's you know he's probably not going to be in contention by the time we get down to it. And you got to keep in mind, it's all about uh, you know every candidate since Bush onward has talked a big game about you know restraining interventionist foreign policy, but those are the only two who've actually talked about it. And we, when you kind of talk about uh, you know we always talk about terms of like public pressure can make these things happen. The anti-war left is very weak right now. You're going to want somebody coming in who actually has a strong position on that. Uh, and mean, then Tulsi, Tulsi yeah. did Tulsi did have a strong uh, anti-interventionist mm-hmm. uh, rhetoric when yeah. it came to talking about uh, t- came, came to the debates. Mm-hmm. I definitely yeah I agree. Um, I think like she could have done a little bit more with her, her opportunity on stage, but I'm, I'm glad that she was kind of speaking out about that. She completely. Like, she had a very similar night to Bernie. I thought that they both started slow, but mm-hmm. overall did well. Mm-hmm. Um, I wish she would have. Uh, she gave a the correct answer on the BS uh, trick question about Medicare for all, which is Medicare for all does uh, Medicare for all does abolish uh, uh, private health care, but if you want private in uh, health and in, private health insurance. For cosmetic surgery or things of that nature, you can still get it. But primary care, primary care that you would get, regardless if you are working for a company or not, you can you would still be able to get even if you're working a temple, whatever, and the government will t- make sure that they are covering 
uh, your hospital visits. Pramila Jayapal and Bernie's also covers dental and vision. So it's it is uh, much more comprehensive, and they also outlaw duplicate uh, duplications of care uh, from what the government is providing. So when it comes to pri- uh, when it comes to private insurance. And that question of would you abolish your private health care to have a uh, government run program? It was a BS question oh, because yeah. Canada, France, Germany and all the other industrialized nations also do have private care. Uh, but their private health care is not the same as their public health care uh, plan that all the citizens get. Correct. So it yeah. is a it is. It was a BS question. I wish she would have raised her hand anyway. But um, I thought her answer was still good. Um, I'm upset that Kamala Harris will raise her hand for this on stage, but then in interviews walk it back mm-hmm. like she doesn't support it. Yeah. So uh, while we're yeah. on uh, Kamala, and I'm not going to take a whole lot of time with this, but I did want to just kind of recap because, again, like, you know, she was one of the big candidates, so we've we've gone through and done like our critique of her before. But I think in light of her her recent poll numbers, and she 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 did very well in that debate. And I'll say this as both a compliment and a warning: she reminded me a lot of Barack Obama, and that she was she was, was she had a very polished performance. She's very charismatic. She's a good politician, and in the immediate sense, she's got a pretty good policy platform her record though is not good and i right, think like, we we've, we've gone over that yeah. extensively and, uh in our and in, in on here but i just i just wanted to go through the quick list like because i know there's some new people coming out of the woodwork it's like i think i support this person i just wanted to keep because like here's some stuff you should look up first you know um so, uh, as California AG, she defended state death penalty laws. In 2015, she blocked gender reassignment surgery for a transgender pr- prison inmate. Uh, she was a firm proponent of civil asset forfeiture even before charges were filed. In 2010, judge, uh, a 2010 judge declared that Harris had violated defendants' rights by hiding uh, damaging information on a police lab technician and judge said that she was indifference to demands that account for its failings. Number five, despite over a thousand violations of reclosion laws, but while well, this is the whole Mnuchin thing, she failed to prosecute Steve Mnuchin. Number six, as DA, she pushed for statewide law to charge parents with misdemeanors of children uh, uh, pay truant affecting low-income communities. Number seven, She resisted efforts to have her office investigate police killings. Number eight, opposed efforts to reform three strikes policy disproportionately affecting black men. Number nine, she worked to keep an innocent man in jail even after uh, uh, serving a decade in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Wait, 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 wait. On that particular one, the reasoning for it was that his paperwork was wrong. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. I just, just, just some context. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, number ten uh, defended a prosecuting attorney who inserted a false confession into an interrogation transcript. Number eleven went after Backpage, an online classified website used by sex workers, putting them in harm's way and challenging First Amendment uh, free speech rights. Uh, it's kind of similar to our sex uh, Sesta Fosta uh, criticisms. Yeah. Uh, number twelve fought a Supreme Court ruling fighting to oppose release of nonviolent offenders. Uh, number 13, when the Supreme Court decided that California's overcrowded prisons represented cruel and unusual punishment, uh, uh, as Attorney General, she fought a ruling ordering California to release some of its prisoners, and she refused to release nonviolent offenders, referring to Governor uh, Jerry Brown as their client. And this has a lot to do with kind of the uh, private prison for profit structure that was in that state. Number 14, refused to back marijuana legislation while jailing black men for it. Number 15, opposed bo- police body cams. Number 16, defended a murder conviction even though her office presented false testimony. And 17, Kamal Harris supported 2008 San Francisco policy that reported arrested uh, undocumented juveniles to ICE. Okay, so I just that was just a refresher. And the main reason I say that is just because she did have a good performance she she did a lot of great things in that debate she she justifiably called out uh joe biden for his his terror his really awful and anachronistic record you know you can't have a pro busing guy run in 20 
20. You just can't. Uh, but at the same time, I just wanted to emphasize to all, all, all the folks out who listen, um, she's got a lot of skeletons in her closet as well, and she talks the talk, but she ain't always walk the walk. Yeah, dog. Um, it it was it was a great thing to see her go after Joe Biden and uh, and chin check Joe Biden on him still supporting busing segregation. Um, it was good to see Mike Mike uh, Michael Bennett talk about how uh, the the compromising that Joe Biden was doing with Mitch McConnell helped them. Uh, make the Bush tax cuts permanent. Yeah, it was yeah. it was a good way to see when Bernie was like, "Dog, you talked about ending wars. You voted for the Iraq War." Yeah, so mm-hmm. like it was it was good to see these people attack Biden because Biden is Hillary 2.0, and I get and I and I uh, was absolutely uh, happy to see those things. At the same time, the reason why the Medicare for All thing bothered me so much. Was that uh, they were saying that a lot of Kamala supporters were wearing shirts saying "I was that girl." That was before she had that story teed up. Yeah. So yeah, if you're telling me a- that if you're telling me that a prosecutor, someone that made a, that was had a career of prepping for a battle slash debate, had had the uh, had the gumption to start printing out T-shirts and uh, and uh, um, and. Uh, Signs that says I was that girl when you knew you were going to drop that information in the middle of the debate by going after Joe Biden because the media likes controversy and they and they just went bananas over it. Mm -hmm. But you're telling me that you misunderstood the question that was given about Medicare for all and you walked it back. And this is not the first time you've walked back Medicare for Mm -hmm. all in your town halls. You've done it multiple times, then it means that I cannot trust what you're saying because I don't believe that you actually believe what you're saying because you will backtrack from a stance that recently just came out 56% of the country supports. Yeah, exactly. Independents, Republicans, yeah. and Democrats mm-hmm. support Medicare for all. Mm-hmm. And you're walking it back. So your political instincts when you are in front of a crowd, uh, uh, in front of the American people are uh, are good. When it comes back to you having a your private position on one-on-one interviews, then you're saying something different. I don't trust you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, exactly. And, you know, that's what we tell our listeners all the time. Politicians will say a lot of stuff. You got to look at their record. What did they actually do? Yeah. Um, and I will say, you know, to her credit, more than a lot of these other candidates who get some some amount of corporate money or um, have kind of been rubbing shoulders with, you know, DNC consultants, um, you know, she has spoken about those things a lot better and has a better policy platform. But, again, you know, uh you know, uh, talk is cheap. Trust is expensive, and you got to earn that. Um, yeah, man. And uh, I actually, uh, there was a but, couple other people that I need yeah. to talk about. Pete Buttigieg, yeah. Buttigieg. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. There are some people who failed horribly. Andrew Yang, I expected more out of. I didn't get. Yeah. Uh, yeah Bill De Blasio yeah. came out swinging, mm-hmm. which was great. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bernie was just being Bernie. He just he just maintained. I need him to be more grumpy, Bernie, because yeah. at first Bernie seemed like they were going to treat him. Uh, treat him not with kid gloves, but treat mm-hmm. him fairly. And they and T- yeah. Chuck Todd and others were just throwing hacky questions at Bernie yeah. uh, the entire times. And th- there's a way that you answer those questions that uh, and you make sure that you get your point out, you beat your point across without losing the audience. And there were times that they didn't. I yeah. thought that the biggest winners of the two nights were Bill de Blasio, Warren, uh, Kamala, Harris. To a lesser extent, Corey, Julio Castro, and uh, and uh, I think maybe Christian, because Christian had some really good answers about corruption. So did Warren. But Beto O'Rourke, oh disaster! Uh, Sick of forking uh, him. He's done. Uh, oh no! Muda Judge. When they asked him about the racism uh, of the cops that that was in his community, and he said, "Yo, I failed as a, I failed uh, running my city. You failed running your city. So why are you running for president? You failed at your job of protecting your city. 
You failed your city. Out of your own mouth, you said that you failed your city. Why should we be voting for you as president? Also, the stories of how he backed the racist police officers in South Bend and the unrest that's been coming out and the fact that the mainstream media will not talk about it. Mm -hmm. They 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 will not talk about it at all. Shows you that they want him to be one of those people that stay in the race, mm-hmm. and it also shows you why third like groups like Third Way are backing Warren mm-hmm. because Buddha Judge Kamala, uh, like Buddha Judge Kamala, Joe Biden, these establishment candidates, they were not as appealing. To the voters of the base, yep. and now, and they are still trying to push those people. Uh, they're trying to push those people or anybody who's not Bernie. Mm-hmm. So they will. So it's it's their gatekeeping philosophy. You can be as left as Warren, but you cannot be as left as Sanders. Yeah, and no, exactly. As, but but a couple other people that were just that was just in the abyss of just disaster. Uh, Amy Klobuchar. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tim, uh, Tim, whatever his name, who got eviscerated by uh, Tulsi Gabbard. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard <laughs> had a pretty decent. Tulsi, yeah. Tulsi Gabbard had a slow night. Yeah, but uh, yeah, when it came to foreign policy, she eviscerated Tim. Tim Ryan. That was it a was, hilarious moment. It was like, oh my god, like, I am going to take you to school now. <laughs> yeah, it was like, hey, hey, do you see these textbooks? <laughs> hey, you yeah. see, these, you, hey, you see that playground? <laughs> yeah. Hey, you see that lunch counter? Mm-hmm. This is school. Um, I'm taking you there. I've got to give. I've got to give an honorable mention to uh, uh, the meme queen. Uh, of the evening, Marianne Williams. Oh my God! Uh, and okay, I'm actually gonna say something. The first question she was asked, I thought she actually had a very interesting answer, and I wanted to like dig into it just a little bit more. You know, before she started talking. To... Later on in the evening, she became like it, it kind of the, the she's become an, a running joke. Um, Doc, almost like Mary perf- was high. Bro. She's a personif- <laughs> She's a personification of like you know the the, the liberal uh, Whole Foods customer uh, just t- gained sentience and decided to run for president. Um, but the first thing she did to say when they asked her about Medicare for all, her response is like, "Well, we have to look," you know. And she got she, you could start to see she was about to go in a weird direction with it. But she did mention, it's like, we need to talk about all of these other intersecting issues that cause health problems. And I actually thought that was really on point. This doesn't come up when we talk about healthcare in this country. The fact that we have, you know, bad pollution regulations, that we allow, um, you, know, you know, environmental things to happen to our citizens that cause health problems in the first place that, again, we do not address. So I think we need to give her a little bit of credit for that, for bringing up an important important point on healthcare that I haven't heard from any other candidate. Dog, even progressive dog. Ones. But when she said that I'm going to attack y'all, I'm going to attack Trump with love, and she saw, <laughs> and she said that her first priority, her first priority was calling the governor of New Zealand and telling the and telling her that America is going to be the place where you want to raise your kids. What? <laughs> like, like, look, no, here's here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, TYT, TYT did this uh, did this pledge that they've had other candidates sign. It's the Progressive Policy Pledge. So it's it's uh, these five pillars of are you a progressive or not? Will you fight for these things? It's Medicare for all, um, free college and tuition, raising the m- uh, minimum wage to a living wage, ending uh, uh, fighting to get money out of politics, and uh, voting for a Green New Deal, uh, actual Green New Deal that gets us off of fossil fuels. There are um, there are a few people who signed that pledge. Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Mike Gravel, and Marianne Williamson. So when it comes to actual progressive policies that we say that we care about, she's all about. And I have and she also talked about reparations, and she was one of the only candidates that talked about re- reparations on that stage. Mm-hmm. I give her nothing but props for that. The same way that I give Andrew Yang nothing but props for talking about universal basic income. But bruh! But bruh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mary Ann was yeah. tripping, no? yeah. <laughs> and I like Mary Ann. Here's the thing: I like her. I I put her in my like in my top five. Like she floats around number five yeah. mm-hmm. in my top five yeah. of who I would vote for. But bro, <laughs> yeah. bro, she was tripping, bro. Exactly. I, I, well, I will say we'll all regret in 2020 if she's not our commander in chief when we get like a, a huge influx of negative vibes. Oh like, my we're... god, bro. All right. uh, okay, <laughs> so any other thoughts on the debate? We're on eight o'clock, so we should probably 
get the uh, show wrapped up. Uh, I can't wait for the next ones. Um, I thought that the debates were trash because a lot of the... I thought the debates was good, but also trash because the questions from the moderators were trash, man. They were right-wing, yeah. hacky mm-hmm. questions. Yep. And if you are a journalist, you should know about the things... You should know about some of the policy and things that they are talking about. And people like Chuck Todd and, and a few of the other people that was asking questions, they were straight garbage yeah, a lot of uh, them were, were uh, gaff based too. It's like you know, they, who was the guy who got booed about uh, in California over socialism? Uh, for all? Uh, some some uh, Hickenlooper. Hickenlooper. Yeah, but there's an example of like I, I want to like the debate. You want to hear them debate the issues. They don't want to, to like pinpoint like here's some stupid thing you did that got some press attention. Talk about it. Right. All right. So uh, with that, um, want to let you know a couple of events coming up uh, over the, the next week. Uh, on Friday, July 5th, uh, from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., there will be uh, a caged bouquet event at Bronson Park. Basically, it's um, in response to the concentration camps at the border. Um, leave a letter, a bouquet, uh, something like that, signs, etc. cetera. Uh, and then uh, coming up on Sunday, July 7th, out front Kalamazoo is uh, organizing a community organizing class. That will be from 1 p.m., to 4 p.m. over at Outfront's off main office. And then on Monday, July 8th, uh, Southwest Michigan Democratic Socialists of America will have their general meeting. That'll be Monday, July 8th from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. over at the Vine Neighborhood Association. Until next time, everybody, keep on fighting for that revolution solution. Look us up on Facebook and YouTube. That's the Hood Rat Strategist Radio Program.